You know, I absolutely love taking a book of a Bible and just breaking through verse by verse through an entire book, and I long for the time when we're doing that here. But in setting this church plant up, it was essential that we understood the core values that are going to take us to the places that we believe Christ is calling us to. And so it's essential. At the same time, teaching through some of these principles, like the one tonight, small groups function at the basic church, is somewhat, for me, difficult because it's such a broad topic and it's something that we don't have time to cover just how broad of a topic it is and we have to kind of pinpoint the points that are necessary to make in a, in a corporate setting like this. And that's why we've accompanied each one of these values in our equipping track series. It's the last book of our equipping tracks, covers all these values in depth, five days a week, covering one value over five days. And so the details of it are all going to be behind it. But it's important that we understand this one, because this point is something where the church has gone again very astray. And I've been a part at times of that church going astray, because we bought into the concept that programs fix everything. That if you have a program, and you have a program to meet everyone's needs, whatever those needs may be, everything's fixed. Well, programs don't change hearts. And also, programs don't fix values. They don't fix the internal. They can help us along the way, and not all programs are bad, but we've invested the last 200 years in the life of the church, and really the last 40 years, immensely in the life of the church, on thinking programs are gonna fix every, pro every problem. And so we have a program for every age group. We have a program for every area life, uh, area of life, every hobby, every anything in life. We have a program that will be oriented towards that group of people, towards that like, towards that hobby, towards whatever it is. We have programs that are towards this study or that study or, or that area of concentration. And again, none of them are bad if we understand their place. But a lot of them have been implemented to make us what Christ has called us to become, and none of them really deal at the heart with the heart. They don't deal with the core of who we're being. That's why we're starting with these core values, because if we get these core values right in each one of our hearts and we adopt them, we will have in position the layout and the structure for God to do great things. Now understand, I'll talk about this later, but having the right structure does not mean that we're going to be everything we need to be. There's lots of churches that have the right structure and then miss components along the way. And we could be like that if we're not cautious and we don't seek him in everything we do. So we're going to look at this, this concept of small groups function or our cell groups function as the basic church. So let's pray. And then we're going to have four points. If you want a bulletin or a, an outline, they're in the back there. If you want, I think maybe Hollis handed them out. I see some of you have them. But again, if you want more extensive notes on this, I'll be glad at any point. Just let me know and I'll email you notes on whatever we're studying. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you that you've called us to look at these core values so that we might understand how to become the church that you want us to be. We recognize you, Jesus Christ, as the sovereign, as the head, as the leader of this church. And we ask, Lord, that you would lead us, that you would lead us to become a church that will glorify you in everything we do and everything we say, in the actions that we take, in the lives that we live, and in the lives that we reach out to. I pray we'd be effective and we'd be powerfully used by you. I pray, dear Lord, that as we look at this concept tonight, that we would understand that this is talking about lifestyle. This is talking about a value system. This is talking about a paradigm shift in our lives, Lord, and not just the next great program that's going to make us become what we're supposed to become. I pray, Lord, that we would be open to internalizing this and adopting it in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Small groups function as the basic church. The first thing we need to understand is the small group or the cell is the people. It is the people. Um, it sounds, again, like a simple principle, but it's really not because... If we view the cell as a program, or if we view the cell as just a meeting, we are going to miss this principle every single time. When we begin to focus completely on just the meeting, the two hours that we get together in our small group, we're going to expect that everything that needs to be done within the life of the church is going to occur in those two hours. And when there's not a meeting that is full of fireworks and excitement, and if God's not doing great things in our presence in that moment, and that's what we're looking for, 
we will, because of those false expectations, be let down in our own expectation. And we need to understand that this mentality of the meeting being the focus is a pitfall that will have many issues come up and it will become apparent very quickly if that's our focus. The problem is, is that the cell or the small group is the people. The meeting is just a time of the week when we choose to gather those people together so that we might minister one to another. Now the meeting is important. If it wasn't important, we wouldn't do it. We are called to gather together. So it's something that we need to do. It's essential and it's essential because it's what the church in the first century did. And so it's essential that we follow the pattern that was established in the first century. It's a time for us to pray, to fellowship, to share, to worship, to look at the word. It's a time for us to be mutually edified and to build each other up and to be equipped. It's a time for everyone to have opportunity to, to share ministry and to use their gifting. It's an essential time that we need to have. And it's a time for us to come together and to concentrate on those people that God has placed in our lives that don't know the Lord. So that together we might reach out into their lives and see them come to know the Lord. The meeting is a very important part of the picture, but the meeting is important because the people are important. The meeting is just the time that we gather. Now with that being true and people being the cell, the people are called to be the cell or the small group 24 hours a day and seven days a week, not just two hours on some given night during the week. That does not fulfill our obligation of having a shared life. That does not fulfill our commitment one to another. That means that everything that's going to occur in the life of the small group cannot possibly, nor was it ever intended to occur within two hours. That's not the objective. But I know at times I've come to a small group meeting and I've walked out saying, boy, nothing really amazing happened tonight with almost a sense of disappointment. And then I have to catch myself and say, wait a minute. People who decided to share their life together spent the night together. How can that ever be a bad thing? How can that ever not move us forward? How does that not burst and, and push us into community further and further? It does do that. And so it's always a good thing. Now the community that is in the cell and the community that we will experience is simply a byproduct of our relationship with the Lord. And we have to understand that. If we come together to meet and none of us have had a strong relationship that week with the Lord and we're not vibrant in our relationship with the Lord, why do we think when we come together all of a sudden there's going to be this spiritual moment? What happens in the meeting time of the small group is simply an overflow of our per personal relationships with the Lord. I've learned that over the years. The stronger the individuals are walking with the Lord, the more opportunity there is when we gather for the Lord to do some great and amazing things. And the community of believers cannot and will not go further than we go in our individual walks with the Lord. And so when we come together, we need to come together prepared. We need to come together spiritually prepared, mentally prepared. We need to come together physically prepared so that we might be awake and alive and ready to see what God's going to do in our midst. We need to come ready to share our life and to share our gifts and to share our abilities. As we study the New Testament, we can quickly and easily find community experienced in small groups from beginning to end. It's throughout the entire first century church. We see it clearly. And that's why it's so important. It wasn't just a once or twice a week thing though. It wasn't just a focus on that gathering. It was a lifestyle. So understand when we talk about our small groups, we're ultimately talking about a shared life and a lifestyle together. Here to me is the most apparent picture of what New Testament community is like. It's in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we taught on this in one of the first weeks of this church plan. Uh, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, and this is an appearance of, of community right here, and had everything in common. You don't share with people you don't care about. That's just a fact in our lives. You don't open up your life, open up your possessions, open up who you are with people that you don't care about. You won't care about people without spending time with people, and you won't care about people without spending very intentional time with people as far as individual relationships go. 
selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. They even went so far as to sell their stuff if somebody in their body had a need. Every day, and that's a key word, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And there we see the large corporate gathering. They just happened to do it every day. That was what they did at that time. Understand, everybody had come to Jerusalem to see Jesus and to have a census, and they just never left. So they didn't have jobs, they didn't have things to do, and they met every day. It would be great if we had the freedom to do that, and we don't. We don't at this level. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So not only did they meet corporately, but they met in their homes. They shared their life, which is symbolic of the meal that they shared together. They shared their life together. And notice that they did it with glad and sincere hearts. And I think sometimes in our modern version of Christianity, let's just face it, is anybody other than me very busy? We get so busy that sometimes we don't always prioritize. Sometimes I don't always prioritize the right things. Sometimes... If we get honest, we might go through one of those moments where, oh, yeah, I got to go to that small group tonight because I made a commitment. Or, you know, I got Steve coming over tonight. Great. You know, we might have those. But really, has anybody else ever had that attitude? You're going to do a good thing, but you're so busy that you're not focusing on the right priority. And they did so on a regular basis with glad and sincere hearts because they knew when they were together, God could do great things. And he can work in their midst. And we need to have that same expectation. And they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That's community life right there. The greatest picture to me in the entire New Testament. Right there in those seven or eight verses. They met corporately. And they met house to house. It is all about a shared life. It's all about spending time together. We do not know how to minister to one another if we don't spend time together. And we should have that desire. If you jump ahead to Acts chapter 5 and verse 42, it says this. Day after day in the temple courts, corporately, and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. And we see this pattern over and over and over again. Now, here's the problem. To meet corporately on a Sunday night takes commitment. And it takes time. To meet together on a weeknight, whatever that weeknight is, is additional time. To meet together outside of that and grab lunch together or hang out together or go on a hike together or is additional time. And we've allowed ourselves through our own choices to become so strapped in the area of time that sometimes the relationships that matter so much in life are neglected, ignored, or not given the time that's necessary for them to develop and grow. And I believe when God places us in a local church together, he places us together because you have something that I need. And I'm not talking about your material possessions, although if you want to even give me some guns and some other toys that you have, I'll be okay with that. But no, in all seriousness, you have something that I need in my life. Gifts, abilities, talents. I have something that you need. You have something that each other needs. He's placed us together by design, not accidentally. And if we don't spend time together, we have to think about the possibility that we are cheating ourselves and those we're involved with out of God's greatest blessing that he may have for us. Out of his greatest ministry that he may have for us out of the greatest gifting and use of those gifts that he may have for us. And so it needs to become something that we prioritize. And so the first thing we see is that the cell or the small group is the people. The second thing we need to see is that the people are the church. The people are the church. Now, we may just say, well, that's basic. Why in the world are we looking at that? How many of you in the last month have said, I'm going to church? We say it all the time. Now, it's habit, it's vernacular, but it's inaccurate. We're not going to church, we are the church. We're simply going to celebrate together. We're the church according to the scriptures. And it's a mindset thing that we bought into that going to the service 
is the event or the program or the fix-all or the time when everything's going to get taken care of. And it's not. It's important. That's why we gather this way. But it's not the time when everything that needs to happen in the week is going to instantly happen. The people are the church, and the church is the people. Those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior make up the church, and we learn this often as we study God's Word, and the local church gathers in local congregations because that's the plan that God laid out throughout the entirety of the New Testament. Have you ever thought about it? The book of Acts talks about the whole first century church and its establishment. The book of Romans specific group of people that gather there as a local church. And you go through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Corinthian church, local congregation. You can go from there, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philipp you know, all of them. You go through, and what do you have? Thessalonians. It's all written to local churches or leaders of local churches. There is a need for us to gather locally. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says this. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. That whole chapter, the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, is a great exposition of the body of Christ and the way all the parts are valuable and the way they all work together. And everyone who's in a relationship with Jesus Christ is part of the body of Christ. And that means that the you in this verse is you and me and those who are gathered locally, just like the Corinthian church was gathered locally. This is foundational to our understanding of what the church is and to how the body functions. And if we don't accept this truth just completely, we won't see clearly the roles that each of us and the value that each of us have as a local congregation. Now, logic is never, according to scripture, just a bottom line for anything. However, we're not called to be illogical. We're not called to be um, not studied, not learned, not dealing with the intellect. We're not called to just be dumb. That's not, but however, sometimes logic is opposed by scripture. It just is. It's a fact. Sometimes what God does is illogical by the world's standards. It doesn't make sense. But when it doesn't oppose scripture, we need to look at it carefully. And in this case, we need to know a few things. We need to know that the first point is that the small group is the people. Now we've learned our second point, that the church is the people. If the church and the cell are both the people, then the cell is the church. A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. What was that called? The transitory, what was that called? Anybody remember that mathematic principle? What was that? Algebra. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I don't remember what it was. I think it was called the, something like the transitory principle of something or other. I can't remember. Anyway, A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. The small group is the, is the, is the, small group is the church. What am I doing? <laughs> now I got my thinking of what the principle is. <laughs> the small group is the people. The church is the people. Therefore, the small group is the church. So what that tells us is that the small group, when it's gathered, because it's made up of those who are in Christ and gathered in the local church, there's nothing that can't happen in that small group. But think about the way we've limited this one. Only pastors can lead in giving the Lord's Supper. Show me that in Scripture. I challenge anybody to show me that in Scripture. Only pastors can baptize people. Show me that in Scripture. Can't show me it. It doesn't exist. We have made boundaries about what can and cannot be done that are not biblical. We put standards to God's Word that don't exist. You know what I love to see? I love to see a father baptize his kids. That's what I love to see. I love to see a husband baptize his wife. Love to see it. I love to see people who share Christ and lead up. Let them baptize them. Why does it matter who does it? It's their obedience and it's their testimony that's being highlighted and taking a, a you know, giving Christ the glory. It's not the individual who does it. Don't you remember when Paul says, I baptize so and so, and if I baptize anybody else, I don't remember? You don't even remember. Because that's not the point of it. <laughs> but if we don't understand this principle that the small group is truly the church, we will miss the activity that can take place there. If Dave or Mark or I are not there, there is still nothing that can't happen. Anything can still happen. It's not bound by an elder being there. That is not what dictates what can or cannot be done. 
The Holy Spirit leads and the small group is the church. And if it is the church, it can do anything that can be done when we're there or when we're not there. There is no limitation on that. This helps us to understand that the people are the cell and the cell is not the meeting. The meeting is just where the people gather. And we can accomplish anything in that small group that many of us in our formality and in our religion that we've learned have been told only certain people can do that. And it's just not biblical. Some of you might struggle because you've had a strong Christian religious background and you might struggle with this. But I challenge you to find it in the scripture. Because let's just take the word pastor. Dave and I were talking about this before the service. The word pastor, how many times do you think it's used in the New Testament? Any guesses? One time. That's it. The word elders, plural, is used over and over and over again, signifying that there's a plurality of leadership, just not one person who's supposed to be in charge. And we need to understand our mindset needs to be biblical, not religious. And we need to understand that. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says this. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the, other, to all the others. We have a shared life. Just because we have a role of leadership in the church that God has called us to has no more greater value than the one that you have. Just different roles. It doesn't matter. God says we're all equally valuable, we have differing roles, and we're all to use what God has given us to the fullest. And that's the way the church is supposed to function. Look at Matthew 18 or 20. 18 and 20, rather. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. If Jesus said that, is it true? In fact, if anybody said it in the New Testament, is it true? Yeah, if it's in there, it's true. That's why it's in there. Sometimes we do that too. We put more emphasis on what Jesus said than on what the rest of the scriptures say. It's all God's word. It all has equal value. We need to understand that. Where if two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. You know what that tells me? If two or three of us are gathered in Christ's name, we are the church. We are the church. Just functioning on a smaller scale. And we put all this formality and said the church is this, and we've put God in a box that he doesn't belong in. Now, is everything we've done bad? No. Is structure bad? No. Are all the programs that we've instituted, are all of them bad? No. I'm not saying that. But we can only expect them to do what they were set up to do. We need to understand that the people are the church, and when two or three of us are gathered together, notice the focus, in his name, we are the church, and we can function as the church, and there are no limitations to that. All right, third point. The church gathers as cells or as small groups. Now, as we continue to study the Bible and as we continue to learn, we're going to learn a whole lot about the Lord's church because the Lord's church is God's vehicle of operation in the world today to bring glory to himself. And that's what he's using, that vehicle. We begin to find some of the depth of the church and the relationship that we have with the Lord and with each other. We start highlighting and seeing how we interact and it's all based on us being the church. We start seeing great things begin to happen. We also begin to see the early patterns of how and why the church gathered when we study the New Testament. There's basically three relationships that I can find in the New Testament of the body gathering that were repeated over and over again in the first century. The first gathering is the one-on-one -on -one gathering. The church gathered together to one-on-one -on -one often. And there's example after example of it. And all of the one another commands help us to understand the intimacy of that relationship on a one-on-one -on -one level. The intimacy that we should have one-on-one -on -one and the shared life that we should have in that one-on-one -on -one relationship. I don't know, I forget exactly how many one another commands are, but the New Testament is riddled with them. Love one another, honor one another, consider one another, consider others better than yourself. You just go through all of the one another's that are in there, serve one another, love one another. There's a great way for that to take place one-on-one. -on -one. That's the first relational um, situation that I see repeated in the New Testament. Second one is a small group, over and over again, house to house. 
house to house, house to house, house to house. How do I know that's a small group? Only so many people can fit in the house. I get that. It's over and it's over and it's over again. And then we see the third one, that large group gathering and the corporate gathering. They met usually when these churches were established because they were established in many Jewish communities. Usually they met in the synagogue. And they met over and over consistently. And the pattern we start to see by the end of the first century, and even midway through the first century, is they were meeting on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, over and over and over again. And that was what they did. It was the pattern that was established. Now, in order for us to be complete as a church, then we need to gather in the ways that the Lord has established. And those are the three ways that he has established. And for us to meet in small groups becomes essential if we want to see all that the Lord has for us to see. If we want to see the fullness of life that God has for us, we need to learn to meet in those ways. Because we need the dynamics, we need the gifting, we need the talents, we need the abilities that each of us bring. And as I've said many times, on a Sunday night gathering, very few of us get to use our gifting. Very few of us get to use our ability. But in the small group, it's open to everyone to minister. Not that it's not open when we gather in this setting, but the format oftentimes does not give room for that to take place. In the small group, ministry takes place. And it's based on your gifting. It's based on your ability. There will be a different level of ministry that takes place in those small group gatherings. There's also a different level of ministry that takes place one-on-one. -on -one. They're each unique, and they're each special, and they're each necessary. Now, there's many scriptures that indicate that not only was there a corporate gathering, but there was a small group gathering. And the small group gathering took place often in the homes of Christians, and it was vital, vital to the life of that church body. Let's just look at a couple of those. We saw Acts 2.46 already. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Hospitality is part of the Christian life. Opening up our homes and saying, you are welcomed here, we will share life here, is part of our responsibility one to another. Another scripture is Romans 16.5. Greet the church, greet, greet also the church that meets at their house. Some of the churches in the New Testament only met in houses because there was no other option that they met in. It was a house church. And there are still churches today, in fact, one of our our sister churches up Valley in Newcastle, they just meet in houses. And I forget how many they have. They have about 20 different churches that meet in houses. And they'll never get bigger than what they can meet in a house, and that's fine. You can do that. I see all three meetings, though, as the best option and as the most essential way to be the church. And so we see that here. In 1 Corinthians 16.9, we see the churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. At their house. And then in Colossians 4.15, it says this, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. There's no question that there was a small group gathering. And you can find it over and over again, and there's many verses that show us both gatherings in the same verse. Corporate and small group. Both are absolutely essential. And for us to be complete as individual believers, the small group should become an essential part of our life. And this is the part of life where we as a church need to adopt that and say, I'm going to be committed, and it's another commitment. Now, here's the thing. It's not my job, nor is it Dave or Mark's job to make anybody do anything, and I don't want you to feel that way. I just want to share with you the scriptures, what they say, and then allow you to spend time before the Lord and say, maybe I ought to consider that. I can tell you this, for those of you who are gathered and gathering on our Wednesday night small group that we currently have, are there not unique and special relational value that's coming out of that? Is, is God not doing some great things as we gather together? Have you not experienced the level of relationship with the people in the room that are that is different than what you would have if you were just gathered here? I see head shaking because it's it's a blatant yes. It's a very obvious yes. And so I'd like to invite all of you to consider that. And in fact, tonight afterwards, uh, Mark and Dave are going to start a second small group. And if those of you who aren't involved in a group, if you'd be interested in doing that, just talk to them afterwards. And say, hey, I'm not currently involved in a group I'd like to be. Or if you are involved in one and you think you'd like to be involved in the beginning of this week, we can have that happen. 
And you might say, hey, I think I'd really mesh with those guys and their families, and I want to do that. That's where I'd like to be, but it's essential to the life of the church. Last point. Small groups or cells are at the core of body life. Now, our first three points have basically taught us the structure that God's laid out for the church. And we've come to realize that the small group is the people, the people are the church, and therefore the small group or the cell is the church. And we gather together in small groups because it's a part of the first century structure, therefore it needs to be a part of our structure. Now I think it's important that we need to understand the why before the how, behind the how rather. If all we had was structure, and we had the right structure, it does not guarantee that everything that should happen would happen. There are many structures, be it businesses, be it organizations, be it clubs, that have great structures and they still don't accomplish great things because there could be clouded vision, there could be bad values within the structure, all kinds of bad morals within the structures. Structures don't guarantee success. But why would we shoot for anything less than the structure that God has laid out in the scriptures? And so we shoot for the structure and it's important and it's a start point for us. We'll gather together as the church in small groups for many reasons. A, we know it's biblical because it's what they did in the New Testament. They gathered that way. When we come together and we realize that we come together in a small group, we'll start experiencing gifting, talents, and abilities that differs from what we can experience in this setting and differs from what we experience one-on-one. -on -one. But that doesn't completely answer why. In the small group gathering, we're going to experience the Lord and each other in a way that is very different from the one-on-one, -on -one, from the corporate gathering, and community will be experienced and expressed at a level that is completely unique as a part of God's design. It will allow us to share life in a richer and in a more real way than what we do here. How many of us have ever come into a corporate setting and you come in and you've had a, just an awful day and everything's gone wrong, but you still put some nice clothes on, put a smile on, and act like everything's okay in the Sunday gathering. Anybody ever do that? We have. Guess what? If you're hanging out with the same group of 10 to 15 people weekly, and then you spend time together outside of that, even on top of that, you can't fake stuff like that. Now, some of us, that makes them comfortable. Because some of us are at a point in life and going through something, and we don't want to be real. But yet, in being real, there's healing. In being real, there's ministry. In being real, there's God's answers that he might use others in the body to give you and help you with. In being real, you might minister to someone else. When we keep it hidden, and we can do that in a corporate gathering very easily, we might miss out on God's best. And we need to understand what we experience together allows the Lord to unite us in deeper and richer ways. Now, this gathering is at, the, it's at the core of body life. In fact, in my years in the ministry, I believe that if we were to order, and I don't want to do this, but if I were to order the significance of, of ministry that I've seen take place in the gatherings, I've seen more ministry take place in the small group, real ministry take place there than in any of the other gatherings. Doesn't make the others less important, but it's where people really get to use their gifts, their abilities, and their talents. So the cell, or the small group, is going to need to function as the basic church. Anything that happens here can happen there. Anything that happens in the New Testament can happen there. We need to be devoted to one another. Community is the result of those relationships and of being real as we focus on the Lord together. These relationships are built through a life that will deepen and enrich each of our relationships and our walk with the Lord, and it will tie us together as a church body. Let me just give you 12 benefits of the cell structure. And I don't know, you didn't put this up there. Here's 12 benefits of the cell structure. First of all, it provides, it provides an environment for accountability, which is something that every Christian needs. It does. It provides an environment for accountability. Like I said, we can fake each other out in this setting. Come in, say, hey, everything's good. How you doing? Put a smile on our face, give each other a hug, walk out at the end of the night, nobody knows anything that's going on in our life. That's a reality. But if we spend time together, we will give accountability to one another. We can't demand it out of one another. That's not God's plan. We give it as we learn to trust each other and walk together. We give accountability to one another. And when we're struggling, we say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Will you help me with that? And then when they come up and ask us and say, hey, how are you doing with that? We can't get mad. We say, hey, thank you for asking. I know you care. I'm doing better with that. 
And accountability is a great thing. It's a buzzword that's been thrown around the church for a lot of years, but it's very rarely practiced well. It really is. But there will be clear accountability for everyone as we give it to one another. And it will help all of our walks with Christ. Second thing it does is it provides each member with an opportunity for personal ministry to the others. It does. It builds relationships, which provides opportunity, which enriches our relationships, and it gives us the opportunity to serve one another in greater ways. Very simple, very straightforward. Third thing it does is it is the body building itself up as each part does its work, as it says in Ephesians. Let me read that again. It's the body building itself up as each part, every part, does its work. That can't take place in the corporate setting, but it can take place in the small group setting. Fourth thing is it helps ensure that every member of the body receives care and leadership from a shepherd. How many people did Jesus directly lead? Not a trick question. Twelve. Out of that group, how many did he really, really lead? Three. And if we really want to break it down out of that group, he probably spent, as far as I can tell, the most time with one. Now, if Jesus poured his life into 12, although he taught, taught multitudes, but he really poured his life into 12, why do we think with 20 or so of us gathered that one person, any one person, can minister to everybody? See, the small group, even when we're 100, allows every individual to get some leadership from somebody who shepherds and cares for that group. We call them a cell leader or a small group leader. And it really gives that opportunity and it allows you to receive care. The fifth thing it does is it provides an opportunity for ongoing fellowship. We shouldn't have to program fellowship. It should be the natural overflow of our life together. And if we spend time together and learn to like each other and enjoy each other's company, we're going to fellowship together. We're going to do other things than just those meetings. Six, it helps each member apply the word of God as a lifestyle. It helps each member apply the, God, the word of God as a lifestyle. Now, this is important. One of the main, in fact, the most time, a 45-minute section of that small group meeting is built on applying God's Word. Do you know why? Because we know far more of God's Word than we readily apply in our life. We do. So we take what's taught here, we put it into question so that we might learn together, how do I apply what I learned to my life? Application is the key. It's not just knowledge. It's knowledge that's transferred 18 inches to our heart that becomes application. We need to know that seven. It provides an environment for new believers to be assimilated into body life. It really does. When somebody's a new believer or new to the group, the small group embraces them, brings them in, and gives them instant relationships. In the corporate setting, people can come sometimes in a larger setting for months and not know anybody and not really get to know anybody. Eighth thing, it helps ensure that no member's left out of church life. It helps ensure that everybody has a place because people are looking for a place to belong. They really are. They're looking for a family. And it ensures that. Ninth thing, it helps members to be equipped to minister by doing. We talked about members are not just hearers but doers. It gives you the opportunity to be a doer. Ten, it facilitates a church to grow in size and yet remain focused on every member carrying out the mission. That goes back to that accountability. We can grow large and still be small. And I've watched it happen in other churches. And it can happen and it will happen. Eleven, it encourages unity among the believers. Why does it encourage unity? Because we're real. When there's issues, we get them taken care of. We don't ignore them. We don't just make, think they're gonna just magically go away. We deal with them. Because in a small group, you have an environment where you can do that. One-on-one, -on -one, you have an environment where you can do that. One of the greatest pitfalls of the local church today is we ignore issues rather than deal with them. When you deal with them, it's good for everybody if we deal with them rightly. And the last point, it brings each member face to face with the truth about their own lives. It brings every member face to face with the truth, me, you, all of us. When we're together in community, we have to face the reality of where we're at. This church plan is seeking to have a biblical structure. We're seeking to do the things that the New Testament church did. We're seeking to do it in the way they did it. And we're seeking to do it in a way that honors God. That's the journey that we're on. If we have small groups, and we do have one right now, we're about to expand that. As we have those small groups and they keep to expand, more people will have the privilege of experiencing what we're starting to experience, which is a shared life and New Testament community. Now, just because we have the right structure, does that mean everything's going to function perfectly? 
It doesn't mean that, but it puts us in position for that to happen. So one last scripture, Acts 20, verses 20 and 21. You know that I have not hesitated, this is Paul speaking, to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly, corporate gathering, and from house to house, small group gathering. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks, so no parameters, didn't matter, any people, that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Small groups function as the basic church unit. Will you consider being a part of that so that your life might be enriched and so that all of our lives might be enriched? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. And I know, Lord, that all of us have lives that are busy and sometimes our lives, Lord, are just too busy because we don't prioritize you as our priority. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help me. I pray that you'd help the others in this room be committed to having you as the priority and to having your church as the priority. And that we wouldn't do so out of some religious or legalistic obligation, but we would do so because we desire to have all that you have for us. We would do so because we desire to have the depth of relationship that you want to exist among Christians. That we would want to be able to be used by you with our gifts, our talents, and our abilities. And that we would want to encounter all of the fullness and the abundant life that you've called us to have. Lord, I know the structure that your word clearly lays out. And I pray, Lord, that as a church we would follow that structure. But I pray in the midst of a right structure that we would encounter you. I pray we'd encounter you when we meet corporately. I pray we'd gather in, in small groups and encounter you there. And I pray, Lord, that when we gather one-on-one, -on -one, that we'd encounter you there because this is all about you. And may we never get confused about that. Lord, I praise you and I honor you and I thank you for the things you've already done in our midst. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to do great works among us. In Jesus' name, amen.